What is up, everybody? Happy 4th of July. Happy weekend. 4th of July is on a Saturday this year. That is fantastic. I hope uh, everybody's having a good weekend. I certainly am so far. It's been a lot of fun uh, getting ready for this stream. As uh, some of you may already know the topic if you're looking at it now. Uh, big shout out to Filomino Boy and Don D'Agilio. Or D I, I think I do that multiple times. Uh, <laughs> very good, very good. Appreciate the super chats. Big, uh, big appreciation and thank you very much. Uh, we got a good crew already in the house. We're already at 100 people and we just hit live basically. So that's fantastic. Nick Smith, celebrating uh, independence for our country. Looking forward to the stream. Thank you for the super chat. I really do. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, so we will be doing call-ins, and we will be taking your comments in the chat for this uh, stream. This is Shack Grounding, and oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> There's so many things to talk about. Uh, anyway, let's get started, okay? Anyway, how's it going, everybody? I am Josh KI6NAZ. Thanks so much for watching the Ham Radio Crash Course. I'm trying out my new glasses uh, because there have been nonstop fireworks in our neighborhood uh, for the well, city, really, for this whole week. It's been absolutely insane. So I got my new polarized jams on. Uh, <laughs> they're they're green, actually, teal, and so the, you can see them come through. But anyway, I'll be wearing those in a bit here. So we, uh, we are having some, I guess there's like a, some people coming over to the block and we're going to be handing out hot dogs and stuff like that to people. So that's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thanks everybody. DX Commander, what's up, buddy? Hey, uh, he had a really good video. Check his out of the Ham Radio crew, I think, or he'll correct me in the chat. But uh, video that with a lot of the European folks who can't, you know, we, we sometimes can't work out the same shooting schedule for the Ham Radio bunch. And so it's really nice that you can still get different opinions of, of people across across the pond, as it were. Uh, I'm going to have fun today, so I am going to dip into my, my beer, which is the brewery, the bakery oatmeal cookie. This is an imperial stout brewed with oats and aged in bourbon barrels with raisins, cinnamon, granola, and natural flavors. This is a 10.2% percent. so, whoa, buddy. Uh, I am using my extra glass here for the Ham Radio Crash Course. These are available on hamtactical.com. Leia has been busy. You know, last uh, week was field day. And I will be putting out a video kind of on my debrief of field day, kind of my thoughts of the whole thing and how it all went down. There's a dark, dark boy right there. Um, but she came out with a, a new shirt, and I was going to show you that really quick. So hamtactical.com, she's got a new item here that she cooked up. She calls it uh, the Gain Gang. So it's a t-shirt front and back that has a, a Yagi on the front. And on the back, it says uh, Gain Gang. <laughs> so uh, I will definitely be uh, rocking one of those for sure. <laughs> Some of you are already getting t-shirts from last week, so I, I hope you're enjoying them. Let's see in the chat. Roll Tide for Chelsea. All right. My hoodie is on the way, Don says. HRC, uh, K6ARK, what's up, man? Yeah, seriously, uh, Cal doesn't sleep. <laughs> He's up all the time. Mm. Ooh, that's a. Uh, ooh, that's a little on the sweet side. Ooh, I don't know about that. It's, it's barrel aged. That's nice, but it's on the sweet side. Adam L with the super chat. Thank you so much. You are a wonderful resource for us. I'm looking forward to the future of Ham Radio. I am sipping on some homebrew IPA right meow meow. Meow, please. Meow. Very good. Thank you uh, for that super chat. And uh, and obviously, drinking some uh, homemade beer. Very good. Another note. Let's hop over here. Soul, the SoCal Soda Fest, Saturday and Sunday, August 1st through the 2nd, 2020. Grab a radio, get on the air, and make contacts. Hike to a scenic summit of your choice. See SOTL.AS for list of destinations. Award given for given ca or different various categories. The write-up, though, is pretty cool. So the idea is, and, and go check this out. The link should be in the description. The write-up for this is uh, amateur radio operators from around Southern California will be hiking up to the tops of California's greatest summits 
to make radio contacts with other amateurs locally and around the world. If you are new to ham radio, this is the perfect opportunity to get outdoors and practice your radio skills with a supportive and amazing group of people. Summits on the Air is a award scheme for radio amateurs that encourages portable operation in mountainous areas. You can find more information on the SOTA website here, and there's a link. And then SoCal SOTA Fest has three main goals, which is uh, make summit to summit contacts, which is always super fun, because when you're uh, an activator, you're trying to activate the summit points for the summit you're on with the four contacts. But if you make summit to summit, you get those points for that summit as well. So it's like uh, extra value added if you are an activator to work summit to summit. So for sure, that is awesome. And then provide an opportunity for people new to SOTA to experience the thrill and adventure of hiking up to beautiful and remote destinations and making radio contact with others. And give chasers an opportunity to earn tons of chaser points. Yeah, so if you have a lot of people activating, the people at home that maybe couldn't go out that day can work from home and get the points for all those summits. That is very cool. That is one of the major reasons why people are so into soda is it's not just about hiking to the mountain. It's also about getting those points after you activate or, or if the chaser's on the ground and he's working somebody that's activating. Super, super cool. Keith, hey, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Just want to make sure before we dive into this whole meaty, meaty, meaty subject uh, that I cover all my news stories. Soda Fest. Oh, yeah, and the 12 Colonies event is online right now. Now, uh, what I've noticed is a really good way of tracking that is to use the DX cluster. You can Google that, and you can look at the DX cluster, and it'll tell you the different events that are online right now. If you do uh, the 12 Colonies ham radio and just Google that, you'll find their website. And so it's the original 12 Colonies. They have a station that is running. In fact, I could just do it right now. Why am I? Why am I? Uh, I'm sorry, 13, 13 Colonies. I don't know why I said 12 colonies. Sorry about that. Anyway, so the website is 13colonies.us, and so these are the operating stations, K2A, K2B, K2C, so on and so forth. And there's also a Great Britain station, and there is, of course, Philadelphia, which is WM3PEN. And so if you work all of them, I believe you get, uh, well, you get kudos for that. But there's more rules there. I'm not going to assume, but there's a certificate you can get if you qualify for certain things. Uh, I think I'm in there a couple of times. Anyway, I guess I should have downloaded that uh, log. I wrote down my logs, but I should print that out and uh, try for it later. Anyway, yeah, 12 colonies is Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm thinking in my head, what is we talking about? Bill Brown uh, says, hey, Josh, my wife still wants to know who the YouTube guy with the beer is. <laughs> Keep up the good work from uh, KE. For NYM. Mm. Don already got his clean sweep yesterday plus the bonus station. Congratulations. That's awesome. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Well, today is a patron picks episode. The Patreon side of the house, I do a lot of things specifically for them. And one of the things I do is every month, the producer level patrons will, I'll give them a list, a long list of topics, and they'll pick the one they want. And whichever one gets the highest vote, that's the topic. Shack grounding, ham radio grounding, has been on the list, I think, all of two months. It didn't make it last month. It barely got edged out by mo the mobile radio video that I did last first weekend of the month. Couldn't I couldn't push it off any longer. I tried to put up really hot topics that people would, would pick it on. But no, grounding was the one that won. And so we're going to talk about shack grounding today. Why is uh, why am I being kind of hedgy about the whole thing? Well, shack grounding is a really contentious discussion in ham radio. It is possibly more contentious than antennas because there is safety that goes into it. There is following the code. Uh, there are building codes that involve or revolve around grounding of different things. Obviously, your AC ground in your house, for instance. So there are a lot of discussions in this topic and there are a lot of myths there's a lot of things that people say and believe that aren't exactly true so i'm going to try and focus on what i think are the big items that you should know and if i don't include it it's not that it's not important it's that either one it's trending towards the the myths and and belief side of the house or it's really really difficult and you may or or complicated 
and you may not need to know it because it's not that much of an added value. There are going to be corner cases, extreme situations of places where shacks exist that I am not equipped to help on necessarily because of the specifics of your particular setup. So um, SH, wow, SH Rutledge with the $50 super chat, giant pair character waving flags and turning around, making the buildings in front of him tremble. That's what it says when I look at it on my chat program that I'm running, but it's actually a sticker. It's a giant pair literally jumping around uh, waving flags. So that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. Mm. All right, without further ado, I'm not going to belabor this any longer. We're going to dive right into this. Okay, so the reasons to ground, bond, and earth. And, and I mention earth there because a lot of times earthing gets uh, thrown into the mix with grounding. It can be used interchangeably, but some people get very specific. Think of magazine versus clip. People get like really um, specific about what they mean. A lot of people refer to earthing as the actual like ground rod, ground spike connection to that location, earthing the station. And then grounding your station could mean uh, some confluence of bonding or connecting devices as they go out of your shack and into the ground rod you've dropped or some kind of AC ground connection that, that you have in your home. Hold on, this is uh, very distracting for me. There's an air conditioner on and I'm getting uh, blown out on my end. Somebody still commenting on the 12 colonies? Yes, I apologize. Not 12 colonies, 13 colonies. <laughs> okay, so the reason to do this is safety, right? You, I shouldn't have to really explain it, but here it is. This is for you, um, your person, the people around you, and your equipment, and also your home, because if you're, if you're tapping into somewhat of the power system that's running your equipment, I'm thinking about power supplies, amps, that kind of stuff, you know, you're going to want to do this right so that you don't cause a problem, cause a fire, damage your equipment, you get the idea. Also, there's a bit of reducing of noise received into your radio if you do this a specific way. And it can help in things like static buildup. So an antenna on your roof, for instance, or on a tower as the wind blows on it, it will generate static electricity. Negative ions will get pulled off, it'll become positively charged, and that will want to find a home. It would be really good if you had a ground rod somewhere in the mix before getting into your shack so that you could let that static electricity off, right? So those are things that, that would help you out. Noise, static drops, all that stuff. Now, I'm going to be covering things. I'm not going to be calling them out specifically. In some cases, I do, but all the times, I do not. And that's the NEC Article 110. The link is in the description. Mike Holt has a website. It's uh, a website that helps electricians get trained and understand different articles and different code practices. So you want to check that out. Again, the link is in the description. Uh, Mike makes this a lot easier to understand what's required, and it can be a heady subject, and it's not really written in a way for the layperson. It is written for someone that's going to become an electrician. So keep that in mind. Okay. Grouthing, gr grouthing, grounding, earthing, and bonding topics. So we're going to talk about the AC safety ground, which is like the third prong in most of your homes. The lightning ground, which is protection from lightning, although that's kind of a misnomer. We'll explain why. And then shack grounding, and that's kind of going to be the meat of this talk. And we're going to walk through grounding, bonding, and then shielding. And some of these terms can be, again, kind of convoluted together, but you'll get... It'll make more sense. Somebody lit up like a barbecue uh, because I'm getting like charcoal fumes in my in my shack area right now. It's a little disconcerting. So if alarms start going off, just hang on. The stream's not dead unless it literally catches on fire. I will be back. So what's the difference in all of this? Uh, AC ground is the safety ground in the electrical system of your home. If your shack is running off of the AC mains, you will need to interface this. Likely, this is uh, like your power supply will interface this, your amp, your computer, things that have that third prong. Relatively modern homes will be in accordance with the NEC Article 810. However, there are radio-related issues that can make this a problem, and, and we'll talk about that. And specifically, when you have a PSU that's connected to the third prong, an amp that's connected to the third prong, and kind of what that means. Lightning ground is generally referred to as separate from your AC ground or your shack ground, but it, it really isn't in some cases, which I will explain or hope to explain. 
And then shack ground is kind of how well all the components of your shack onto the power system are connected. This is called bonding. And then shielding is protecting your station from RFI getting into the radio. Uh, John Moore, RF grounding. That would be like your shack grounding, and that's a part of the bonding and the shielding that we'll be talking about. Okay, so here's kind of an ideal setup. Uh, on the right-hand side is your ham radio antenna. The blue line is the coax. It goes into the wall. There's some kind of interconnect, and there's a ground, a green ground line to a ground rod, and that connects to that shielding on the coax, right? So the sides of the uh, connection the interface or the interconnect for that coax into your shack and then that goes into your amp and then goes into your transmitter and your transmitter is powered by the AC line so is the amp the power supply is providing DC power to your transmitter receiver and that whole AC connection connects to the breaker which then also connects to a ground rod and if you notice at the bottom there's three vertical ground lines. Those would be like your ground rod spikes, and they are bonded together. The bonding six-foot part is important because the code stipulates that you be no shorter than six feet between your bonded ground rods. So this would be an ideal code setup. Um, all the devices are connected. And what's not listed here, actually, I noticed that oh, I did. I screwed up a little bit. There's not a ground line, but basically we'll, we'll cover it in detail when we zoom in. But all of the equipment, the power supply, the, tr the TX, the receiver, same unit, the transceiver, and the amp are all connected to ground. However, this is kind of more likely than what, you, what you'd expect. And that is the, your shack is far away from the ground rod that is associated with your breaker box. The breaker box usually has the ground rod kind of right before, right down at the bottom or they're using some kind of specific setup. Uh, oftentimes contractors will drop two rods but those will be bonded together and you may not have access to the second one. It might be hidden away. You may not even know where it exists in your home. But then you see on the right hand side you've got this long AC line and then you get to the shack and then boom there's another ground rod because a ham likely has dropped a ground rod into the earth and that's how they're connecting to the shack interface into the house into the radio system and again we'll show zoomed in pictures of what this is supposed to look like when we get to shack grounding but you get the idea you could be far away this isn't ideal because it's the ground rods you can see on the bottom are not bonded Good Game Ham Radio Outdoors. How much does Josh spend on his artists? Uh, Josh is his own artist. I use my I use my iPad Pro with the pencil and I just draw. Uh, I'm not pretending to be an artist, but if you get the message, then I met my goal. All right, so then there's a lot of you out there who have an even worse situation, like you're on the second floor and no ground rod, basically, in a lot of cases. And we'll talk about why that may be the case, right? Um, Obviously, you could drop a ground rod, but there might be reasons why you wouldn't want to do that, which, again, we will cover. But if you're in this situation, who oh boy, that is not a good situation to be in. All right, so let's talk about the AC safety ground. So, again, this is the third prong in the U.S. safety ground on your outlets. If you're in the United States, they look like the one you see there, which is a GFCI plug. And it connects in some way to your breaker, which is that gray box on the left-hand side. Generally, you have two hot uh, bus bars or, or, you know, it's got a better name. I don't know it. And that's where your breakers are connected. And then there's a neutral line or neutral bus that connects to the white line of the plug and interfaces with the ground line. The safety ground is always a path to neutral. It's a second path to the neutral, which then connects to ground eventually. So if you get an open neutral, like the picture shows, you won't uh, basically electrify the equipment because the ground can always, the third prong can always step in and, and help the return path. So a note on GFCI outlets. It's a good indicator that you're having issues in your shack um, shack's ground and the shielding around your shack and whatnot if you trip them when you're transmitting. Really good example of this is like a uh, 440, a 70 centimeter transmitter, handy talkie. 
you can key up and it you can trip the GFCI circuits pretty easily in some cases. Um, obviously, that's because you're literally transmitting the RF. You you kind of are the shack, if you will, holding the the radio, and your RF is is hitting them directly. However, on your your shack radio, it's generally logical that if you have decent ground, you shouldn't be tripping them. And if you are tripping them, well, it's likely that you're putting out a ton of power. Um, there are a issue somewhere with your ground. Maybe your antenna is a little close to the house and it's getting close to the GFCIs and it's tripping them. That's just a note on GFCI. Okay, so lightning protection. What's the deal with lightning protection? So this is... Somebody was outside. <laughs> this is an example of, of my lightning protection, which I use an inline uh, coax connector that has a ground lug that takes, you can't really see it because it's on the other side, but that's where the circle is. There's a six gauge wire, and that's the least thick wire you want to use for a ground line to for lightning protection that goes directly down and interfaces with the ground rod. Um, there are other versions of this, which I will show here shortly, that connect directly to the ground rod. And what this is doing is it's trying to give the most efficient, straightest, shortest path from the antenna, which could get struck by lightning, all the way to the ground. The idea being if you give it a shorter path, then it's not going to necessarily go back up the coax into your shack and obliterate everything there and then, you know, up on, on through the line. Okay, so this is an example of the other one. This is a mount that goes directly to your, um, your ground rod. Generally, these use some kind of spark gap device. When there is no spark, the, the RF just passes right through it versus when there is a spark, it jumps the gap, it, it connects to the ground rod and dissipates. This is something you should have if you have an antenna, obviously if you have an antenna, but if you can, because again, this will also help out with relieving the static electricity buildup that some antennas can get. So if you haven't thought about having a ground rod near your antenna or near where the coax enters your shack, it's a good idea, and that you can have a lightning arrestor connected to that, which can help for numerous reasons, but one being somewhat protection from lightning, which, which I'll talk about here shortly. And the note there at the bottom, make sure you're using a mechanical connection to the ground rod. Solder, if hit by a lightning or, or closely adjacent to the lightning strike, can immediately liquefy and explode. So blasting solder everywhere, um, blasting solder everywhere is not generally a good idea. You get the idea. That's why I use a mechanical clamp-on type of connector, which I will show here shortly in a couple of images. Now, keeping in mind with lightning strikes, a direct lightning strike will pretty much decimate anything connected in the path. Even if you use really good lightning protection, um, you're still going to probably destroy something in your shack or whatever's connected to the coax. Possibly even so far as, as damaging things connected to the AC power in your home. So if you live in an area that experiences a lot of lightning, it's generally a good idea to disconnect those things when the storm is coming or if it's really active where you are and there's lots of lightning feel free to just leave your equipment disconnected and then disconnect it when you're going to operate even if the lightning strike is not on your antenna or on your shack or whatever you could still have damage to your equipment even if it's an adjacent lightning strike so keep that in mind the lightning protector arrestor is not necessarily always for a direct strike. It's for strikes that are native around you. It's for handling, again, stray static electricity. You get the idea. Hopefully, um, it's pretty self-evident why you might want to do this. Okay, so shack grounding. All right, so shack grounding, again, this is going to be in your shack. What do you do to your equipment in your shack to get an appropriate ground? So shack grounding, under most situations, you want a good and short connection to the ground rod associated with your shack. Um, all the devices that connect, and basically for all the devices that connect to your radio or connect to whatever is the first interconnection for the coax coming into the shack. So your tuner, your amp, your computer, obviously your antenna. 
it's good if that all has a path to ground and is relatively short for reasons I'll get to in that box there at the bottom. This includes your antenna before entering the shack. If your lines are long, what could happen is the length, if they get to the point of being one quarter wavelength of the band of operation, they can act as a resonating element. Some people refer to this as the ungrounded ground. You effectively have a long ground line coming off of your radio. It is one quarter wavelength of the band of operation and you transmit and you start to get an echo, your own echo back through the microphone and, and potentially being transmitted that way. This shows up as kind of a, it sounds like a ghost voice, not really a ghost voice, but a voice right behind your voice. And that leads to issues with, again, RFI in your shack, because now you have a radiating element in your home somewhere, leads to problems tripping the GFCI circuits, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, thanks, Edwin, for the order of the thank you for the Contact 7-3 shirt. That's one of my favorite shirts. I really, really like that one. Okay. So here's my earthing uh, connection to my ground rod, one of them. But um, this is the primary one that connects to my antenna and my shack. I'm using a mechanical connection. That's what you can see there. And that's a weed that's actually grown out of the hole. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't rip that one out before taking a picture. I don't know why. But that, that's my connection. That ground rod is driven in eight feet down or the length of the rod, which is a, a little over eight feet. For grounding earthing rods, this would be something that you may connect to your shack, may connect to an antenna. They're generally 8 to 10 feet, and that's per the code. And I installed mine with a demolitions hammer, or demo hammer as I referred to it. This, With this device, you basically have a small jackhammer that you can rent from like Home Depot or wherever. It was like 50 bucks for me to rent it. It comes with the bit that is for driving um, the actual rod directly into the ground. And I think it took me all of four seconds when fully powered up to just ram that thing in. And actually, I also got the core saw to cut that hole. So I cored out the hole, rammed it down in there, rammed the uh, rod in it attached the the mount for the clamp and then made mechanical connections to both what you see is that black six gauge wire and that green six gauge wire let's see got a comment from james hannibal hey james thanks for watching uh josh what are your thoughts on the dx engineering radio rf ground plate kits dxe rpg sc it's a large copper plate that goes under your rig in the shack um so it's actually for comms equipment um it's so going back to James' comment, a lot of people might use those if they're in an apartment or a second story. So that would be something where you may want to use it, but I don't think it's ideal. I've not tested them, but we, we will talk a little bit about apartments in a second or people on higher floors. Flying Squirrel, hey Josh, thanks again for all the advice and videos. Just got my Soda Beams Banhopper 3 as well as a bunch of Ham Shack tools you recommended. Awesome, have a great stream. Thank you, Flying Squirrel. Uh, Dom is in the chat saying five feet is the the code requirement for comms. Uh, okay, good for any comms equipment, but longer is always better. Sure. So okay, you have five feet now instead of eight. I would recommend eight or ten though. Good game ham radio says fence post drivers work for driving grounding rods too, and they are cheap. Yeah, sledgehammers work. Uh, the fence post is okay. I think sledgehammers get a bit more force behind them. There's lots of uh, ways to put a ground rod in. I find drop the 50 bucks, 45 bucks, and just use a demo hammer and, and just handle it that way. You'll be done in five minutes. My wife is, is trolling me in the comments right now. We will be talking about how to find RF in your shack here shortly. Now, aside from the, the five foot, as we've been uh, corrected, thank you, Dom, for your for dropping a ground rod, there are alternatives. I'm not going to tell you if that's code or not. You should look that up on your own. But people have laid horizontal ground rods down two or three feet or four feet flat because they can't get through the bedrock uh, after so many feet. It's just it's earth, uh, it's rock, and they can't get through that hard pack. So people will lay them horizontally. Uh, that is an option. There's something called an oofer ground, which is basically a grounded rebar system in the encased concrete for slab foundations. That seems to work for some people. But again, um, these are conflating 
some of the AC ground that your home may have versus the ground rod that you may use for your shack. Keep that in mind. TJHJR2 says, believe it or not, if you just dirt soil, no concrete, soaking the ground real good makes for an easy installation too. Yep, that is true as well. If you soak it, uh, pour some water, knock a couple inches in, pour some more water, knock a couple inches in. And if you have to wait for it to soak down, it does help. Okay, so shack grounding, from my point of view, starts from outside your home. I'm using the example of this MFJ universal window feed through. I don't have one of these, but the concept is the same if you were to use something else. What this is allows you to do is have an interconnect, a coax interconnect of where the coax meets to a mount point for your home or your shack that then connects through that to your radio inside your shack. The best way to ground your station and, and reduce RFI is to try and reduce as much of it as you can outside before ever getting in the shack. That will save you a lot of headaches. And one of the best ways to do it is have an interconnect system like this. If you notice where that yellow circle is, there is a ground lug. You can go from this interconnect, so you have your UHF 1 through 4 on this connection panel. That means it's interfacing with the shielding on the cable and you can drop a ground line off of this panel to your ground rod. This is like effectively, um, it, it's basically effectively like if you had your antenna connected to ground, if you had one location for this, this would be a good location to put it. If you weren't going directly off of your antenna, like if you had a big tower or something along those lines. So for me, this is kind of the option I do. I have a bit more homemade version of this. Um, I don't have this MFJ window solution, but I really like the solution. It's, it's got a lot of options for you. It has an end connector. It has four UHF connectors, a balance line connector, a random wire, ground, multiple different things. And then it's got, I don't know what that, that uh, black cable connector is, but regardless, I like the solution. So if you're thinking about something like this, this would be a good idea. Now, make sure I got all that. This gives a good connection. Yeah. So inside your shack, we haven't gotten there yet because I want to drive home the fact that you should interconnect to your coax and bring that to ground before it enters in to your shack. And the advantage of that is you can do things to your coax outside to knock off stray RF that once it's in your shack is kind of a pain to deal with. All right, so once you've done that, once you've got your interconnect connected to a coax, that interconnect is connected to ground, you can go ahead and start obviously connecting your rig via the coax connections in your radio and your equipment. But while you're doing that, you're probably also looking at your equipment going, hey, there's a ground lug on this, uh, this radio, this amp, this tuner. What do I do? Well, you're gonna obviously connect all that. Again, six gauge stranded wire is what I use. Um, and you want to make sure that they connect to a central location or an interconnection inside your shack, like a ground bus bar or something that is specifically designed for grounding a station or grounding electrical equipment. Um, appliances or, or heavy tools generally have a ground bus bar. We're no different. We, we have, we're sensitive equipment as far as the, the power consumption is and grounding the equipment goes. So you might as well get yourself a grounding solution inside your shack. It makes life a lot easier. Super chat from Andy M3 Lulz. I like the name. Hi, Josh. Love the streams. Keep, keep up the good work. Just getting back into radio since passing my foundation many years ago. Just got the FT3 and 878. The learning curve is steep. Yes, particularly through those uh, two radios. The advantage is that those radios give you a lot of room to grow, uh, particularly for DMR, and obviously you'll be covered with Wires X with the FT3. The FT3 in particular has a lot of functionality beyond that of the 878, but I, I, I think it's I think it's easy to do, so you should enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Good. So here's the there's the meat and potatoes, hopefully, of of this whole shack grounding section. So we've interconnected again, starting from outside. We interconnected our coax to just outside the shack, dropped a ground line or a connection to the ground rod that's close to the shack itself so we don't have that extra long ground line that could behave like a radiating antenna, a radiating element. 
that all feeds into my shack to this alpha delta switch the alpha delta switch has a spot on the screw hole there where you can see there's a screw that connects to a ground bus bar for my shack and you can see I have one ground line coming in that's from the interconnect for the coax outside of my shack connects to the bus bar through the hole using um, a automotive type you know round hole connector and then you've got four six gauge stranded wires coming into that bus bar and kind of an example of what that looks like at, at a cartoonish level is the image you see below there that I drew. So I have a computer that's connected to AC. My power supply is connected to AC. The power supply is outputting DC into my transmitter receiver and the transmitter receiver is connected to the tuner via coax and, and there's actually a power line that goes between the, the transmitter and the receiver to the tuner. You would probably put a ferrite on that. And then the coax goes out of the tuner and out to that shack interconnect. But all of the grounding spots on those devices go straight to a bus bar, the bus bar you see above in that image. And then that last line takes it out of the shack to the interconnect, which then connects to the ground rod, right? I'm starting to repeat myself, but it's important to understand so that, uh, that I get all the information out correctly. I'm keeping this fairly straightforward too because I don't think this is anything complicated. I, I think that you can get your shack safely, up to code appropriately, grounded, and do shielding to prevent RFI relatively easily. And, and this is a relatively easy solution as far as I'm concerned. So just make sure you're, you're doing good connection, you're using good wires, and you're using appropriate ground bus equipment in this case. Uh, I'm using the Alpha Delta switch, which is a, a part of the antenna system, but the reason I'm using it is because it interfaces with the shielding via the coax connectors, and then that connects to the ground bus bar. Uh, the, what you're not seeing is that the Alpha Delta has a, a bare metal spot for that mount specifically designed to connect to the shielding, and that's where the bus bar is interfacing. Okay, so ground loops. All right, so that's what this whole slide's about, but I like the images so much I could just talk to that for a couple of minutes. So ground loops are basically where you have, and, and I know this is where you get into kind of the myths of, of grounding. There are a lot of images online, and in fact, if you're on the Discord chat right now and you scroll up, you'll see an image of like a bunch of equipment, and then they've got these drop lines, and then you've got this long running horizontal line and all the ground lines are connected to it and they've got these circles in the middle of it well technically that's what i have here right if you think about it um so basically that's kind of what i have here i've got a, a bar copper bar in the case of my drawing and i've got ground lines that drop off and connect to that line and then that goes out to the antenna the ground loop situation is where you have like redundant grounding and that's causing a kind of a, again, a, a loop effect, not necessarily a physical loop, that's causing these odd um, RF radiation patterns that again show up on your microphone as noise when you're transmitting and can affect some of your receive side, but that's more or less from the shielding aspect of your equipment. <coughs> Good Game Ham Radio, thank you. Oh, I was—I thought Leah was saying something. No, there it is. Brett, thank you for the order of the Fang Gang shirt and general shirt. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Off of hamtactical.com. James Hannibal, he asked a good question. Isn't a wide, flat, braided copper grounding cable what is typically recommended instead of regular braided wire? Yeah, absolutely. That's a better solution. In fact, I probably will be upgrading this sometime soon to flat braid. And what that looks like, um, it's in my car, for instance. I actually have a, a spool of it. That is flat braid that you kind of bunch up on one end and you attach a, a connector that you crimp on. So a good manual connection. And you can go straight out of the back of your equipment to that bus bar and then again out to the interconnect. James Hannibal, even better, solid copper strapping tape. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, John Moore, great question. We will get to that, I promise, is asking, would it be okay to connect your third wire ground to the bus bar here? No. I'll, I'll spoiler alert it. You don't know how far the AC line for that third prong is in your home. It could be really, really long, all the different wires. You just basically turned your wiring in your home into a potentially a rating element again because it's gonna at a certain point a certain length it's gonna become its own radiating element this ungrounded ground so no I would not I would not connect the third prong to your your bus bar I would have a proper ground rod that is bonded to the grounded bar um, sorry the grounded rod that is attached to your uh, breaker panel in your home Again, following the code, you want to have your ground rods bonded together. So eventually you would like to see your shack ground rod connected to the ground rod for your breaker in your home. That is the appropriate NEC code way to do that. Okay, okay. All right, so when you have it right, and this will actually come up later because I already took some questions and I'm going to try to answer them. Uh, proper ground will facilitate your transmitted RF making it out of the shack and not wreaking havoc on your electric devices. So if you still get mic bite, that's where you, you kind of get up on the microphone like this or, and you, you get a little bit of a shock, you get an RF burn. USB devices stop working when you key up. Odd reactions in devices in your home, lamps come on, oven lights go on. We had somebody that when they transmitted FT8, the oven light would turn on, and when they stopped, the oven light would turn off. So it was a really good timer for uh, tracking when, when, the, uh, when the dad or whomever it was, uh, was was transmitting FT8 at the time. Oven light's on. Dad must be on FT8. And again, GFCI outlets will trip if you have issues with this kind of poor grounding where RF is getting into your shack. So if you have any of those problems, it's likely you need to revisit your shack grounding. <laughs> Philomino boy, all of this information and safety stuff makes me understand just how fantastic DMR is. That's good. DMR is good. But, well, you know, come on. <laughs> you're, you're working some of the Internet, though, with that, right? Which is fine when it's fun time, but if it's bad time and you're you're on emergency power, it's an emergency situation, I don't know that I'll be depending on DMR. So I think I have good ground, but I'm still getting straight RF in the form of noise. So at a certain point, you get your grounded equipment to a bus bar, you get that out of the shack with an appreciably short connection to a ground rod. You think you're in a good situation, but you're still picking up pesky noise. Noise is going to show up in the form of literally, you know, the noise floor on your radio is going to go up and it's going to fluctuate up and down. And there's going to be stuff going back and forth like a wave going back and forth. All that stuff is RFI, stray RF in the form of noise. So if that's the case, it's time to start looking into the shielding of your equipment. This is my wife's laptop charger, which is uh, an extremely noisy uh, RFI generator. Generally, even with adequate grounding, your shack is still at the mercy of RFI, generators in the form of devices in and around your home. I made a video titled, uh, We Are Killing Ham Radio, and it, it's literally, we're killing it by putting all these electronics in our home. As we've added more electronics to make our lives more convenient and fun and kind of amplify our free time, right, our enjoyment time, with all these electronic devices. The problem is, is that all those devices, at least a lot of them, generate RFI. And what I mean by that specifically is the power leads of these devices can behave like antennas. If they have switch mode power supplies, switch mode power supplies will, as they switch, will send out a pulse through the power line and act as an antenna. When that happens, you will see it displayed on your radio as noise. The flicking back and forth, the one really strong, what looks like a carrier, just boom. And then it's, you know, every multiples of hertz down the band. Those are all kind of what you see when you get RFI in the shack. So that's when you start looking at mitigating it. In my case, this was one of the most recent things I found was my wife's laptop charger. I used a snap-on 
Mix 31 ferrite. And I wrapped the cable as many times as I could, in this case, just once. But that seemed to do it. It seemed to knock down the RFI. It became quiet again. It still works. It's still a charger. It didn't affect that at all. But now she's got this little dorky, um, dorky little black uh, ferrite off the side of it. So I've had RFI from my clothes dryer. It's a gas dryer, but the front end of it is electric, the panel. My refrigerator, notoriously noisy noise, uh, RFI generator. And then anything that has an uh, AC to DC transformer, which we kind of already said. Most of these cases I treated with a liberal use of ferrites and toroids. K6 ARK portable radio, uh, yes which is one of the best things to recommend soda and poda in some cases depending on the park soda in particular though if it's a, a summit that doesn't have a radio tower on it even if it does if it's a microwave tower you're going to be fine so freaking quiet the the rfi it's it's like you you don't even know that you have the antenna connected it's so quiet uh it's just fantastic i love doing soda i love that that's one of my favorite things is you get everything set up you turn on the radio and you're just like, is it on? I, I barely hear anything because it's just so quiet and the signals come in so strong. All right, so suppressing RFI, even with your shack ground sorted, you can still find yourself with RF in the shack in your home, in in your home. Live editing, great. There are a few ways to knock down that noise. Snap on ferrites, and I kind of rate these of intensity of how good they are. Snap-on ferrites for HF, again, please use Mix 31. If the item you are purchasing online does not mention the mix, the type, the mix of the ferrites, do not buy them. There are really cheap deals on Amazon for a mixed bag of ferrites. Most of them don't mention the mix. I am dubious of most of them. Don't buy them. I, I would prefer you go with something that lists it specifically, spend a little bit more money, get some bigger ferrites. They'll often do a lot better for you. You will generally need more than one wrap around the wire that you're connecting to, connecting the ferrite to. And generally what I do is I want to put the ferrite as close to the spot where the wire comes out of the device, I believe, is creating the RFI. So if you go back to the picture of the charger here, the upper wire is the AC into the, the device. The lower wire is the DC out to the laptop. I tried to put it as appreciably close as I could to the wire coming out of the charger. You can experiment with this, though. Try it on the, the DC side, not liking it, put it on the AC side. What gives you the most nullification of the noise? That's the one you stick with. Okay, toroid cores. Toroid cores are the big, you know, kind of epoxy metal ring. It looks like a magnet ring. It's not. It's a toroid. Again, mix 31 for HF. Generally, they have a 1.4 inch inner diameter, which gives you the ability through most coax to put at least five passes of coax through it. The more is better. Five is kind of the base for getting the work done. And, and what that's doing is it's multiplying the attenuation every time you wrap. That includes the ferrite, the snap-on ferrites as well, but the toroid cores. When I need to bring out the, the big guns for bigger issues, it's generally a toroid core I'm putting on it. If I'm talking about uh, my antenna in the back of my radio, the DC connection in the back of the radio, it's a toroid core I'm putting on it. In my car, electric car, running a ham radio on HF, oh boy, toroid cores on the coax on the dc wrapped as many times as i can appreciably uh, there there's an upper limit to this there's a a, a what do you call it a break-even point where you, you don't really get any more out of it diminishing returns that's what i'm thinking about wrong economic ter term the diminishing returns after a certain point you don't get any more value out of it so experiment with this start with five wraps if you can put six put six do you see an appreciable drop in your noise I have definitely done this. It's a lot of fun. Scratch that. Finding the generator of the noise is uh, you, you take your frustration level from like, I don't know what's going on. I hate this noise floor. Insane, insane, insane. You find the generator and you start putting the ferrites on it. And when you start seeing, like on the 7300, this is a really good radio for this. When you start seeing the noise floor start to come down, you start to get really excited. 
and the, throw the more wraps on there, and all of a sudden you're like, I killed it. I killed this noise generator. Hallelujah. Wrap it as many times as you can, but experiment with it. Start with five and turn the radio on, turn your noise generator on. If you've knocked it down, great, five did it. If it didn't, throw another loop. Didn't do it, a little bit drop, need some more, throw another loop. Uh, I went so far as purchasing a, was it a 10-foot AC connection from a power supply in the in my computer just so that I could get an extra two loops through the toroid core. And guess what? Totally knocked out the RFI. All right, so here's some pictures of the uh, RFIs and, uh, sorry, the toroids and the ferrites I used. I personally buy things through Palomar Engineers. Link is in the description. If it's not, Google Palomar Engineers. Not only do I like the quality of the products they make, I like their website. There is a wealth of knowledge in understanding knocking down RFI. There's some grounding articles in there. There is a wealth of topics that is on the Palomar Engineers website. It's a total service to ham radio. I am not affiliated with Palomar at all. I have spoken to different people there, both in person and on the phone. Great people, super, super enthusiastic about helping hams. Uh, their email traffic, if you try to email them, they can be a little slow, just keep that in mind, but really good stuff they make. Again, uh, we still have an active coupon code, HRCC73, all capital letters. I believe you get like five or 10% off. And in fact, I just I just spent like another hundred dollars on some stuff uh, from them because, again, I put my uh, step IR up, and it must be a more sensitive antenna because I picked up a lot more noise, and it's coming from inside my house. You might be saying, "Well, how do you know it's coming inside your house? How do you know the noise came from inside the house?" We'll talk about it. Okay, so some common issues. Let me go back a step here. Common issues. You know what? Let me just. I'll just mention it. I'll do it now. I know it comes up a little bit later, but if you want to track down where the noise is coming in your home, where it's coming from, you know, the devices that are spitting out the RFI, the easiest thing to do is you put your radio that is experiencing the RFI problems, again, 7300, really good radio to do this because you got that waterfall, put it on a battery, turn the radio on, connect it to the antenna it would normally be connected to, and then turn off all the breakers in your home. Leave the main breaker on, turn them all off. Then going breaker by breaker, turn them back on until the noise returns or starts to creep up. If you were on breaker three and you turn on breaker four, there was no noise on breaker three, you turn on breaker four and all of a sudden, breaker, breaker, we got a problem, and there's the noise floor comes up, that tells you that that circuit that breaker four is on has some kind of noise generator. So what I do, I don't have it here, it's, it's right up there. My C-Crane Skywave um, SSB, I take that radio, tune it to the frequency that my ham radio in my shack is on, and then I walk around to where that circuit is, and I wait for the signal strength bar to go up. You leave the antenna fully collapsed, you leave it folded on the body, and you literally go up and you put it on the devices. And if you see it bump up, that is likely an RFI generator. My wife is already talking uh, profusely about all the things I have done to her devices because what I end up doing is I unplug them. And that's a key for me to go back, throw a toroid on it, throw a ferroid, uh, ferrite on it, and suppress the RFI. So that's what I do, that's my process. And so I'll work circuit by circuit, breaker by breaker in my home using my shortwave uh, receiver looking at the 7300 to see when the noise bumps up then i go hunting and i knock every one of these things down with toroids and ferrites you can't mitigate that with the shack grounding the shack grounding can help with some cases particularly in your output signal of of you know crazy rf that's coupling to your ground line whatever and then getting back out um, you can also knock down some of that static noise you can also knock down some noise before it gets into your shack, right? Again, using that interconnect. But if you have an RFI generator in your home, in your shack, you gotta knock that down at that level. SH Rutledge, thank you again. I appreciate the super chat. Okay, so common issues. I have a lot of slides. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how many slides we're on right now, but not enough. So it's already almost an hour. I'm gonna take a sip here. 
I, I lost the air conditioner fight and I turned the air conditioner off, but the air conditioner kept turning back on. Uh, my wife is literally using her phone to, to power control the air conditioner back on. So if you don't like the noise of the air conditioner, post in the comments, comment to Leia, turn the air conditioner off. All right. So some common issues that come up a lot. What do I do if, uh, what do I, what do I with a shack far away from the home ground? That's fantastic, Josh. Nicely done. If your station uses long ground wires to get back to the ground, you are introducing higher impedance than expected and potentially causing more issues within your radio, like the ground line behaving like a radiating element, as we talked about earlier. Common issue, a lot of people experience it. This is why you don't want to interface with the AC ground. You want to drop a ground rod close to your shack outside that you can have an, a, a coax interface to help you knock off stray RFI and there you go. You might be tempted to install a second grounding or earthing rod. NEC code requires grounding rods to be bonded together. Rods must be spaced no closer than six feet and generally contractors install two rods but don't take my word for it because I don't really know what they did. I don't know what the history of your home is. And I suggest if you can drop a new rod close to your shack, bond it to the home's ground rod. That is code that will basically equalize the impedance of the differing ground systems. That's kind of what the point is of bonding them. At least that's my understanding. I am not an electrician. I am not an electrical engineer. Don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> here we go. So everybody that asks, I'm in an apartment. I'm on the second floor. So my shack is on the 1800 floor. How bad is this? It's likely very not good. Uh, there, there's all kinds of problems that come up with this, largely because, again, if you dropped a ground rod, that ground length of cord or wire that goes out of your, your shack is going to become the length of a radiating element. And then all of a sudden, hey, look at that. What, what did I do? I have heard there's not a lot of good options for this. I've heard of two things people do. I have heard of people pulling up the carpet, pulling up the flooring, laying down copper sheeting and screening on their ground, and then put the carpet <laughs> purple linny. Oh my God, it's hard to focus. Keep getting, keep getting distracted by the spousal stuff. I'm not. My wife is uh, in the chat though, fighting. I think, or just yelling at me. I'm not. I'm not reading it, Leia. You got the air on. You got your way. So they have laid down foil and screening underneath their carpet, and they're interfacing the grounds of their radio to that. The concept is, is that it's acting as kind of like a counterpoise so that it's hopefully lowering the impedance down to a certain level and getting closer to a ground. What's happening, uh, in super layman's terms, is when you are increasing the impedance of your radius connection to ground it's making it more susceptible to rfi coming back into it if you can lower it down then you're in effectively raising the noise floor or your effective ability to not hear the noise the noise floor drops but you're effectively you're raising it anyway i'm not going to get into that just keep it layman's terms uh good grounds are going to knock down your noise floor it's going to help stray rf getting out in an apartment, because you don't have necessarily a ground rod you can drop, there are people who have used that. There was the comment about DX Engineering's ground mat that goes underneath your shack, basically. That would be a similar function. It could have really good uh, use cases of being an effective RF ground, not an effective safety ground for things connected to your shack, though. So you do not want to sidestep the AC ground for any of the equipment connected to the AC lines if you're using something like a counterpoise ground mat that you would interface to your ground system on your radio or if you're using meshing or screening or foil something like that keep that in mind it's a bad situation though I appreciate I appreciate it um, I was gonna say um, well, well we'll cover it because I got another question about it okay so we're an hour in and we're just getting to the questions I pulled from Discord. I pulled some questions from Discord and Patreon. Because, again, this is a patrons picks episode. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, patrons, for, for making me do this. Uh, if you haven't already, give me a thumbs up, too. I'd appreciate it. Okay. So questions from Discord. How do you bond 
when your ground rod is embedded in the foundation. Still struggling with bonding. Is plumber's copper uh, strap a good strap to use for grounding? Uh, if it's embedded in the foundation, you got to find it. Take a jackhammer, pop a, pop a spot out, and bond to that. That's what I would do. Um, or something. Drill into it. Find it. You know, I don't know. If you really wanted to bond to it. Uh, plumber's copper strap can work as a bus bar. So if you had it, you know, underneath your desk or up against the wall, you could interconnect to that with your with your shack equipment. Trevor L. asks, my outlets in my room are not grounded. This happens a lot in older homes. Uh, that's how it's always been for some stupid reason. I'm working on choosing a power supply that works. What should I worry about due to the non-grounded wall sockets? Um, so that I thought of this after I answered this last night, but you, it, your power supply is generally going to have a three prong, um, AC ground connection. So if you don't have an AC ground, a third prong in your home, you're going to basically run into a problem where you're going to have to use one of those ground plugs that has a little tab in the bottom and go down to your ground rod or whatever you drop. So you would likely need to drop a ground rod or hopefully you're close to your uh, power breakers ground rod that you can interface directly with that. Uh, with that said, consult an electrician in this case because if you've got really old wiring and you've got a whole situation there that you've inherited, um, ah, I, I'm really careful when I recommend anything with really old electronics or uh, electrical wiring. So while you can do this, and you'll likely be okay if you drop a ground rod just outside, you know, and that you connect to it that way, you really should be safe. So I would consult an electrician just okay to make sure that it's okay that you're connecting a 100-watt transmitter, let alone an amp into a system like that. Uh, JR says, hope he mentions to not mix metals for bonding grounds. You know, I didn't, I didn't make a slide for this, and nobody asked that question, but that's a really good point that I did forget. Um, mixed metals, combination of mixed metals is not good for grounding. I believe it goes something along the lines of stainless can be used with copper, but aluminum cannot be used with copper. Somebody will correct me in the chat. There are certain, um, certain metals that can work together or if they're clad. Uh, I am not prepared to answer that. I apologize. I don't remember that off the top of my head. But please um, do research that beforehand. So generally, you don't want to mix metals. My ground lines are copper. They go to a copper ground rod with a copper mechanical attachment point. OK. People are asking for the Discord link. Discord link is in the description. And we've got some admins in the house that can, uh, can add to that. Justin says, not really shack grounding per se, but when I got my mobile rig first set up uh, with the SSB5, I was worried about lightning strikes on it. So although my standard cars have antennas as well, should I take the mobile antenna off every time it storms? Because I would like to do Skywarn stuff for the mobile station, but couldn't with that risk. Um, if you're worried that there's a risk, take the antennas off and use a coax cap on it. Sure. But Skywarn's going to be all around uh, lightning, right? Carl asks, is it recommended to ground your radio to the PSU chassis? So this is a, a mixed one. This could lead to ground loops, by the way. So your, um, your power supply has a third prong for the AC connection. Boop. That goes to the breaker. On the other end, you attach a ground line down to your ground rod that's outside. Let's say that ground rod is not bonded to the ground rod over there. Even if it was, actually if it was, I think that would be literally the textbook definition of a, of a ground loop. Um, because, no, because those would be connected with higher MP or lower MP. Anyway, that could cause a problem. In fact, that caused a problem with me. We'll talk about that. There's a later question that answers that a bit more. But Generally, you're going to do one or the other, and you really are the best uh, person to figure out which one you should do because once you connect the ground, if you see a drastic change in your radio, disconnect it and try again. See, that's we'll get to this, um, but you got to experiment with this stuff. This is not a I'm going to take an hour today and I'm going to fix all my grounding problems, honey. 
we're going to drop the noise floor significantly. Now, this is a, a never-ending task. You're, <laughs> you're kind of like going to spend a lot of time to get this set up, and then you're going to have to routinely do maintenance of, of finding RFI generators, making sure that your connections are clean outside, tending to the weeds that are growing out of your ground rod. You get the idea. So, you know, absolutely you, uh, you should in some cases, but you shouldn't in others. So absolutely 50-50%. Okay. Okay, question from Boomer. Why can't you ground your radio to the grounding plug in an outlet? Hopefully we answered that, uh, but hey, there, <laughs> I'll get to that super chat in a second. Why can't you do that? Hopefully I've answered it. Hopefully you all know it now. The grounding system is kind of an unknown to you in your home. Specifically, if you know that the grounding rod is way over there on the other side of the house, that means that all that grounding cable that's all around you and all the outlets has to all get back to that grounding line. You hook your radio up to it. The radio is going to go, I got a second antenna. This is going to be great. And so you transmit and you get this RFI effect in your home. You literally start radiating your home with RF. At least that's one thing that can happen. So don't don't uh, turn your turn your ground lines into an antenna. So generally, no, you do not. What you do is you drop the ground to a ground rod outside, and then you bond that to your home's standard ground. Boomer ET asked another question. Is my signal just diminished if I don't have a ground? So I don't know, to be honest, because there's too many different setups where some people may have no ground and be fine. Some people will have no ground and have lots of issues. And then just a whole gradient in between. Generally, what happens to me and what I've experienced is that stray RF gets into your shack, affects your equipment, affects your USB. That's where I've seen it the most. It affects my USB connection to my radio and possibly gets back into your mic or in the mic cable and causes this echo noise in the system. In fact, if you watched my field day uh, stream, I had a hum. And what that could have been is, you know, RFI coming off of the mic system, incorrect grounding off of my amp. I did a lot of work after that. I actually pulled a bunch of stuff out. I redid my, my bus bar a little bit. And I seem to have solved that. I, I can transmit on full amp. And, and I was testing it, actually. I did a live test with uh, Twitch. And it sounds like I got rid of that noise. But that can happen. So should you not ground? You shouldn't not ground. You should follow the code and be grounded. Ben, N0BAA asks, how do I get ground rods into the ground? How, what do I to do when connecting my station to a ground? So it's just whack that thing into the ground, uh, sledgehammer it in. Demo hammer is my preferred option. They are really cheap to rent if you think about it. Um, it can take you hours to hammer in a ground rod. How much is your hour worth? How much is your time work worth if you were to go to work, right? If it's 30 minutes, 45 minutes to go to Home Depot down the street, rent a demo hammer, come home, knock this thing into the ground in five minutes and, and take it back. Well, I'll take the $45. That's cheaper than what I get paid an hour. If you must hammer, you can moisten the ground as you work to help out a bit. And then how, what do I do in connecting to my station ground? Hopefully I've answered that. Your ground rod's going to go down. You're going to connect it with a mechanical connection of some point to a ground wire that connects to an interconnect outside your shack, just outside, like a panel. That's where your coax connects. So you've got full connection to ground, to the shielding on your coax, and then that goes, excuse me, into the shack. That beer makes me a little gassy. Ben, NB, or sorry, N0BAA, bus bar type things too. What should ground, wh where should ground rods be placed? Like how close to your house or how far apart from each other? That's in the code. I don't really have to answer that, but uh, you should use a bus bar if you can. Uh, I don't see a reason you can't. They're pretty inexpensive. So there are a variety of options on the market. Copper clad, full copper, straps, you get the idea. Uh, the rod should be placed outside so you have a good kind of outdoor interconnect again to the coax and you want the run to be relatively short. You don't want a long run. And the rod should be no closer than six feet together. But realistically, they're generally 10 feet or more apart, up to like 20 feet. Mike asks, should I ground my VHF radio in the shack with all of the HF stuff? How do you, how do you ground a laptop at all? 
Uh, VHF, UHF radios generally only need a lightning ground. This will depend on your area. With that said, if you bond the VHF, UHF radio equipment, it often will help reduce things like I've had happen where I key up uh, and we're running power, drop them some power, and like the speaker on a VHF, UHF radio will kind of like rattle or have a problem. A lot of that helps if you put them on the same ground line. Key, Kaiwana. Kaiwana, okay. How do you ground your station if you're on a boat or a ferry? Do I need to ground it if running off of batteries? Generally, I looked this up, by the way. This is not my answer, and I did link this in the description so you can grab the blog. About 100 square feet of ground plane uh, below the water line is, is referenced. I'm not knowledgeable in this area. Please seek out an expert. See the link in the description. It was actually a really good blog. I don't, I don't know anything about maritime radio. Uh, I had G Captain on. He explained a little bit, but I don't know the the logistics of setting up a radio. Okay, questions from Patreon. There's just a couple more, and then uh, I'm gonna keep going for a little while. I'll take I'll I'll leave the phone lines open for maybe like ten minutes, and we'll take calls if you have calls. Otherwise, we'll just take it over to Discord. Again, Discord link in the description. I'm gonna end this live stream. I'm gonna go to Discord, and we're gonna have a live chat. Questions from Patreon. How about on a semi truck? This is from Wes. Wes and I actually did talk last night. I tried to help him out. I generally try to, no offense to everybody else, but the patrons are obviously, you know, paying a bit of money um, every month. So I generally kind of drop what I'm doing to help them when they ask a question. So uh, I bonded my car, which has my mobile HF radio in it. I had to electrically bond all the doors, the hood, and the truck. Diesel semi trucks are going to be a little bit different. I, I've never truly worked on them, so I'm not really sure of of kind of what the differences are there. But what I would do is always make sure you're running a ground wire off the lug from the radio equipment to the truck's ground, or some won't have a ground lug and they'll use the return. I take the return off of the DC line directly to the ground lug that's off of the battery. Now, if this doesn't um, mitigate the issues after doing bonding, sorry, after doing bonding and connecting the DC line, you likely will have to look at the different equipment that's inside the engine bay. That's been my experience. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're in an apartment or renting and can't modify the house, have you thought about soda and poda? Because, you know, uh, we've got, where is it? <laughs> oh, we've got the... Uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> there it is. We've got the Soda Salcal uh, Sal Cal Fest going on. I'm oh, sorry, SoCal Soda Fest going on. Go outside. Uh, be portable. If you have that much of a problem working in an apartment or in you know certain high floors, you're not really going to get around that. There's not too much you can do. You can try it though. Absolutely try it. You could pull up the carpet and lay foiling foil down. Don't buy expensive stuff. Just try it out. Use cheap three mil stuff and, and go up from there. Those are explosions going off right now. I wish I had a better answer, but I really don't. It's it's really hard to work from, uh, you know, multiple levels up. Uh, so from Brad, how can you properly ground your shack if your radios are on the opposite side of any windows uh, from an outside wall? So uh, this is not to code, right? So there's no, like you're, I'm thinking of somebody that's centralized in the middle of their of their home, right? There's no wall that they can go to, so they'd be running, you know, a 30 foot power ground. I'm sorry, ground like 30 feet out. Not applicable. Won't work. Uh, however, in my in my office when I was doing HF, I did bond all of my equipment to my power supply. So I connected all the equipment to the power supply, and that connected to AC ground. That is not code. That is probably not even safe but i was uh, appreciably close to the breaker and i knew that the run was well relatively short where i am now though i'm way far away from the breaker i do have a separate grounding system for that so you kind of have to do what you got to do dennis 86 dm came in with a hot question ground rod optimal length position of ground rods close to rig or close to antenna radials versus ground rods earth ground versus equipment for house ground tips to eliminate rfi around the house and how not to get zapped so i hope i answered like pretty much all of those but ground rods should be eight feet again uh, dom says five feet 
Okay, that's a bit shorter for calm stuff, not for the electrical ground. You can have a rod at the antenna. You can drop a ground rod at the antenna if you're like on a tower or something's far away from the home. Just make sure to bond the, the rods to the home ground. I, I would say always do an earth ground. That's just me. Drop a ground rod and connect to that. House grounds are too long or they're completely unknown. You don't know how long they are and they can cause all kinds of problems. If, um, if you experience RFI in your shack or in your home, when in doubt, choke it out for sure. To reduce RF bur burns, bond all the equipment correctly and get them on a ground rod or get them to an appropriate ground. Joseph, Mike Adams says, I live in a very low sandy soil conductivity area on the shoreline of Florida. Chart shows some of the highest resistance of any soil type uh, anywhere in the world. Would you feel that, the mo that more and longer ground rods would help? Your feeling about the treatment of the soil around the rods with conductive chemical. My plan is to install two ground rods eight feet apart just outside the shack wall about 10 feet distance from the first rod and use braid to connect them. So far, this sounds really good. Oops, uh, the, the leads, that leads to another question as to what do you think of chemical weld material to secure the braid to the rod? Thanks for being available and sharing. So I don't know about the soil conditions thing, but he's in Florida and he said he's near the coastline. So if that's the case, you probably already have a lot of salinity in the, the soil. You don't need to do much with that level of salinity. You're fine. Just drop the ground rod and get on with your life. But he, he does mention um, length of rod. Since it's more is not bad, drop a 10-footer. If you got it, go for it. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, yeah. I'd start with the rod. and I'd start with one rod and go to the second rod if needed. And generally, always use a mechanical connection for simplicity. I've never used the, um, the chemical connected one or the one that like burns itself on the cap. I've never tried that. Looks cool, though. Okay, so here's my parting words on this talk. Uh, we went over time, but that's okay. I'll take questions after this. There is a code. You should try to understand it and follow it. If you don't understand, reach out to, like, an electrician. Balance the idea off of him. I, I don't know what it would cost you necessarily, but if it's a quick question, it's probably not a big deal. Experiment with... Leia just came in here to tell me something i don't anyway she's not watching right now um ex experiment with your shack grounding while staying within the code simplicity is key here so even if the simple answer means doing a lot more work like dropping a ground line it's generally the best to do and the best way to track down noise is to still shut off all the breakers in the home turn them on one at a time checking the radio after each new breaker is powered on if you find noise Hunt around that circuit with a handheld shortwave receiver. Leave the aerial down. Get the radio in close to devices. If you find a noisy device, disconnect it. And then go back to your shack radio and check. Is the noise gone? Add ferrites or toroids to choke out the offending device. You will never have enough ferrites and toroids is my final thought. Use them often, experimenting on their placement. These are the references for today's stream. They are in the description. Uh, big shout out to Dave, KE0OG. I think the first time I watched his video was over a year ago. I think it's been up longer than that. It's still probably one of the better radios and just giving you a really high, a, an overarching, really good approach to grounding for your ham shack. So absolutely. Okay, time to call in. Where is my call in button? There it is. Okay. Let me get my ears on. It's unmuted. If anybody has any questions. Oh, you can't see that. <laughs> okay. There we go. Tan Hat, great overview tonight. Here's some beer money to make up for having voted for this topic. Yeah. Patrons, I, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this was helpful. If it wasn't, though, so if I... D Guys, again, this is a highly contentious um, discussion. People have tons of opinions on this. If I blatantly screwed something up or you think I'm just not that accurate in a certain area, uh, drop a comment. Feel free to contact me. I'm not against dropping a five-minute video saying, hey, I said this. Really, you should do this. doesn't bother me at all. Again, though, I'm trying to get you kind of a... It's beyond beginners, uh, definitely, but... I'm trying to keep you safe, but also make something that's possible. 
So hopefully that makes sense. Hey, first time caller, you probably want to mute your speakers. What's your name? Yes. Oh, hi, my name is Eduardo. Uh, my um, call sign is Kilo Oscar 4 Alpha Echo Quebec. Uh, Kilo Oscar 4, what was it? Alpha Echo Quebec. I got it. Okay, go for it. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Happy 4th of July. Oh, thank you very much. Same to you. Thank you. Just a real simple, simple question. I'm a new ham on... Uh, on HF, and I would like uh, Josh to show me if he can uh, what types of noise and how, how how to distinguish what type of noise on an SDR screen. What is the purpose of determining what the noise is for? Exactly. Sometimes when I transmit, I get some feedback transmission, and I would like to know if he can just show very simply with his hand how that would the different types of uh, noise would show on, on screen. No, I'm, I'm asking, um, wh wh why do you want to know this? That's what I'm trying to understand. You, you want to oh, because, because, visually look at noise uh -huh. and, and know where it's coming from? Uh, exactly. So I can, uh, so I can understand uh, if I have uh, RFI in, in my apartment. Yeah. Okay. This exact question came up on Discord last week. I will tell you the same thing I okay. told them. Don't become a noise whisperer. Don't try to like look at noise and like figure out its little idiosyncrasies. Just shut the breakers off, man. Uh -huh. If the noise goes away, then the noise is in your house. Then turn on a breaker okay. one at a time. When the noise, if, if the noise pops up, when you turn on the one breaker, a breaker, go to that circuit and use a radio or, or start unplugging things individually and check your SDR. If that noise disappears, that's your item. Don't try and figure out, like, learning how where noise generators what is do. What what, right? Yeah, it's, it's right, too difficult. Okay. It, it, some things that look like a power supply noise could be a solar power charger. It, it's too, don't worry about that. Just just kill the breakers. Do the... Uh, the, the more time intensive method, but it's a thorough method yeah. that will that will solve your problem. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. Yeah, yeah we'll try it out uh, tomorrow then. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Right, okay. Bye. Hey, thanks good for calling night. in. I appreciate it. That was a good question. That came up in uh, in Discord. So very good. All right. Well, I don't have to keep going. So if anybody doesn't want to call in, that's okay. Let's check the chat. I got tan hat. Thank you, buddy. Um, let's see. Sean, thank you for ordering two HRCC mugs. Hamtactical.com. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I hope I got Lee Harrell. Uh, I think I might have skipped Lee. He uh, sent seventeen seventy six, seventeen dollars and seventy six cents. Nicely done. Thank you, Josh. I'm a ham because of Ki six NAZ. Thank you very much. Yesterday was my best day so far. Got a new FT eight ninety one set up with the WRC Soda Special on twenty meters, one hundred watts, no tuner. Good job. Nice resonant antenna there. Very first contact was ZL one WN in New Zealand. 7361 miles. Lee, I'm sorry I didn't get that to uh, get that sooner. Great job. That's awesome. Uh, Mr. Andrew, thanks for ordering an HRCC hoodie. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Zach's been posting the link in the Discord. So if, if I'll leave it for a couple of minutes here. I'm going to flip it over to thanking the patrons because this is kind of their episode. Again, thank you, patrons, for putting me through this. I did spend a little time researching this. Uh, I, I have been kind of living this for a little while, working on my own shack, trying to find and suppress noise, making sure I have a good connection to ground. So I'm glad that I was able to kind of bring this forward. I hope this is helpful to everybody. If you found it helpful, give me a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. Uh, John Moore, grounding along with antennas is the never-ending debate. <laughs> you handled it well, Josh. Thank you. Hey, John Moore, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for saying that. Uh, da -da -da -da. 
my neighbors are, are getting turned up right now. I can hear them yelling. All right, I'm going to flip it over here. I'm going to give a big shout out to my patrons. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to the patrons. I'll throw my call ins on here too, just in case we need to do that. There we go. Let's slide that right there. Okay, so if anybody wants to call in, that's still available. But big thank you to Patreon for making this possible. This is uh, their episode. First month or first weekend of the month is the Patron Picks episode. Again, they vote for the topic to be discussed, and this is what they voted on. I'm so happy. No, it was fine. It's good to talk about this. Um, I appreciate everybody being civil. I'll see how the comments go on the back end on this one, because those are always fun, uh, how that all turns up. <laughs> uh, Purple Linny, thank you for the great info. Sorry for hijack. Todd, KJ7JHH, for the 13th colony that was demoted like Pluto. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, there's Hercules, KC1LZR. He knows why he has the orange. There's a couple people um, who have special colors here. Almost all everybody here is a producer-level patron, but there's a couple that stand out, and they have special, special things. Um, they've unlocked special achievements, if you will, I guess, on Patreon. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. I'm checking the comments. Great stream, Oklahoma Ham Radio. Thank you very much for watching. Oh, the phone call just died. So I think, uh, oh no, it's still there. Okay, good. So it looks like at our peak, we had close to 400 people. So thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, 86 DM Dennis, that was the the one in particular I'm thinking about. Again, thank you, Dennis. Appreciate the comments. And uh, make sure, um, really, the help with D-Star was awesome. All right, so I'm going to go to Patreon, not sorry, Discord after this, and we'll keep the discussion going. I will say on the back end, this hit me a little harder than I thought, <laughs> this oatmeal cookie. <laughs> I'd say towards the end of the stream, that kind of went straight to my head. Happy 4th, everybody. You know, happy anniversary of the nation. Uh, I was in Independence Hall about three, two or three years ago. Very humbling experience is the wrong word, but you feel like, I don't know, it just feels important, the whole place. It's really interesting. I, I loved going down there. That particular area of Philadelphia was really cool for me. I'm going to Ben Franklin's home, the whole nine yards. A lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. So, okay, we're just about done here. Thank you to all the patrons again. Thank you to all of you for the support. Everybody who gave a super chat, thank you so much. I appreciate the support. Uh, appreciate the thumbs up if you haven't given one. I would really appreciate that. If you have not already, please subscribe. If you stumbled on me, this is the first time you found me. Well, thank you. Why don't you hit subscribe and, and stick around for a little while. Watch a couple more of my videos. Uh, Todd says, be safe. Don't blow off something you're going to need on July 5th. Thank you very much. I will take that advice. Uh, I am not driving anywhere right on. Thank you very much. I'm just live streaming on YouTube. <laughs> I haven't driven anywhere in a long time, actually, aside from working back, but... You know, not a really good idea to drink and go to work. Anyway, I am Josh, KI6NAZ. I'll talk.